Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Dialogue with the Dean. I'm Eric Barker, Dean of the Purdue University College of Pharmacy. And before we get started with our dialogue this afternoon, I just want to remind you that if you have questions about some of the things that we're going to talk about here in today's episode, that you would just go ahead and type those into the comment section. Uh, our staff are standing by to, to look at those questions, and we'll come back at the very end and address the, any questions that you may have as we go forward. Well, it's a pleasure today to welcome someone whom uh, I am honored and privileged to call friend, uh, John Norberg, who is a, a local author and speaker. John is actually portraying John Purdue today. I'm not sure which John to address him as, uh, but John has authored a very important book as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of Purdue University. John has authored a book called Ever True, 150 Years of Giant Leaps at Purdue University. And so, John, welcome to the College well, of Pharmacy. Good day to you. <laughs> good day to everyone else. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to have you, especially uh, outfitted as uh, John Purdue. And I, I just, uh, at the outset here, tell us a little bit about how you ended up uh, in the John Purdue Well, the, the, uh, I've been working on the book for, for quite a while, and I've been talking in the book for quite a while. And, and my wife always said, when you go out and give a talk, you ought to channel John Purdue. You ought to dress like John Purdue. And of course, like most husbands, I, I didn't. Uh, but she finally said it enough time that I started listening. And she said, you know, really, you look like John Purdue. You should dress like him. And I, I had to tell her that that's not really a compliment <laughs> because John Purdue was not a tall, uh, handsome guy. I even got his trousers out of the Tipkinu Historical Association, measured the waist. He was stout, and he was not long. So, but I guess I do look a little like John Purdue, but I'm trying to look a little less. Okay. Uh, uh, so anyway, I'm having a lot of fun doing this. Uh, sometimes I just go to events and re other retirees and I uh, portray Purdue characters and answer questions people have. Other times I'm actually giving talks or making presentations on TV or Facebook, and it's been a lot of fun. I must say, when you walk across campus dressed as John Purdue, you get a lot of interesting expressions from people you pass, and they're, they're, they're a little surprised. So I, I guess that uh, uh, the fashions have changed in the last 150 years a little bit. Well, if you hang on to that long enough, they tell me it'll come back. So. Oh, I'm sure this will come back someday, <laughs> so, yeah. So you'll, you'll be back in style. So, well, well, thank you for putting on the garb, and thank you for joining us today. Just real quick, is there anything on here that is really a period piece or is, is maybe John Purdue's? No, this when it, okay. it comes to Purdue Theaters outfitted oh, oh. me. So I, call, I called Purdue Theaters and asked for help, and they were just wonderful in providing all of this. And, and it's costumes uh, from uh, uh, organizations that make clothes, for, for different eras, uh, in, in plays and, and movies, or you know, whatever, or, or universities when they're having anniversaries. <laughs> well, your book uh, chronicles the stories of our faculty, the staff, alumni, the students, the leaders of Purdue University, and the role that they've played in 150 years worth of history. Uh, I, I think about 150 years and how much time it takes to, to capture that amount of history. So how much time did it take you to write this book? How many hours did you spend in the archives digging information out? Well, I would hate to think how many hours, but I, I do think I spent more time in the archives for the last three years than I did anyplace else, which is a wonderful place, and I wish everyone would go up there and see some of the things they have there. It, it, I started it in earnest in 2016, and I'm still working on it now, giving talks, so I've been working on it for the better part of three years, the actual researching, the writing, uh, kind of at the same time, and then once it's come out, doing talks and, and uh, uh, talking about it. But actually, it goes back even before then. I worked for Martin Jiske, Purdue President Martin Jiske, when he stepped aside in 2007. We started talking about Joe Bennett and I, who was uh, Vice President of University Relations, talking about doing a book about Purdue history, because it had been a while since there had been one, and we needed to do some updates. And so it started then. But then, it, you know, pe people at Purdue change and, and interest in it kind of ebbed and flowed. Uh, but I was able to do interviews uh, even uh, 12 years ago on, on tape that I did use in the book and that were very important to me in, in the book. And those people I, I talked to have, have, have passed. And so I was very fortunate I was able to get the information from them uh, before that time. Great. As you mentioned, there have been several books about Purdue. Uh, how did you decide on what the focus would be and what do you think sets your book apart? Purdue Press asked me to do a comprehensive book on Purdue history. I actually proposed doing how about 10 fun stories in Purdue's history. No, they wanted a comprehensive history. Most of the books that have been done on Purdue, 
and some of them have been done by me, are on individual schools or even departments. Uh, the School of Pharmacy has a book. Uh, this book is the, is the whole kit and caboodle. It, it goes from the, the whole 150 years, from our beginnings to, to right now. And uh, right now really isn't history. It's more like current events. And one of the biggest challenges was writing about Mitch Daniel years because I would, I would write and, and get finished with his chapters, and then he would do something else. And I'd have to start all over again and, and add that, and then he'd do something else. So I finally called one of his assistants and said, we're going to have to draw a line because history faster than I can write it. So uh, we had to have an ending point. The, I, how, I hope no one else ever again writes a, a, hundred, a, a book about the comprehensive history of Purdue. I hope the future histories are Purdue in the 21st century, Purdue in the latter part of the 20th century. Break it down a lot more because really there is more I did not put in the book than I put in the book. There are more people that I did not include in the book than I included. If I included everyone who deserves to be in this book it would be nothing but a list of names, and uh, it would look like a telephone book. So uh, there were a lot of challenges to doing this, but it, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Through all of your research, uh, it, it, particularly if we go back to the beginning, uh, and at the beginning was John Purdue, what was some of the really surprising things that you learned about our founder, John Purdue? Well, John Purdue was born in, in real serious poverty. The, uh, the, the log cabin he was born in in central Pennsylvania in the mountains wasn't bigger than this office right here. And he had nine sisters, one of whom died in infancy, which was a surprise in itself because usually many more than one, one child died in the family. Uh, his father was a smelter. Uh, his mother uh, took care of the children. They raised a few crops outside their cabin. They didn't own the cabin. They didn't own the land. They owned nothing. Uh, and uh, he, he grew up with very little public education. He, he grew up uh, with a, a few classes that they paid for uh, but mostly he was taught by his sisters. And one of the reasons he was interested in starting a you know, university so many years later, uh, in 1869, was he was somewhat embarrassed about his own lack of education and about his, sometimes his improper grammar. And uh, he understood the importance of an education from a personal, personal level. John Purdue never married, never had children, but he had all those sisters, and he made sure that his nieces and nephews, both the men and women, got educations, he helped them buy farms, he took care of his family. Uh, but one of the things he was always concerned about was education. He was even a teacher for a short period of time in Ohio in public schools, but found that he could do something else much better, make money, buy and sell. And uh, he, he eventually owned, owned a store and came to Lafayette. He was lured to Lafayette by the Wabash and Erie Canal. Mm -hmm. He got here just as the Wabash and Erie Canal was being finished. And that connected Lafayette not only to New Orleans through the rivers, and other cities, uh, uh, but also all the way through the Great Lakes and through New York to New York City. And he knew he could ship goods, he could ship pork. He was known as a pork king in New York. And uh, John Purdue made a fortune, made a fortune through that canal and through the connection of the rivers to, to, to New Orleans. Uh, the state of Indiana paid for a lot of canals and went broke. They actually almost went bankrupt. And this caused him great financial problems. So when it came time to start the university, the state didn't have enough money. But John Purdue did, and he helped him out. Wow, that's amazing. So uh, clearly the book uh, for you as a storyteller is about the stories of the people from Purdue. And, and so what are some of the real memorable stories that, that, that stick out in your mind of the people from Purdue? Well, there, there are many, many, many. And the book is about the, the stories of people. I, I like to tell people, Purdue, not, not me, Purdue, Purdue the university really didn't do anything. People did things right. in the name of Purdue. And uh, this, the, the history of our university is the stories of people. And that, that's what I try to tell. I'm not really a historian. Uh, I, I don't even play one on TV, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn last night. But I am a storyteller, and that's what I try to do in this book, tell the stories of people. And I would go up to the archives and sit there, and uh, they would bring out boxes for me. I'd ask for information on a certain person, and they'd put that box down beside me, and I would open it up, and I'd find wonderful things inside. You start reading people's diaries. You start reading their letters. It's like they were sitting there beside me and telling me about their life and what they did to Purdue. They, they just came alive. Uh, it, it was wonderful. And you, you read uh, a person like our, our, our President Stone talking about uh, the horrors that we had when we had a, a, a train crash, the football team going down in 1903 to a game against IU in Indianapolis. They had a train wreck down there. 17 
Purdue people were killed. Uh, Fifteen of them were students. Uh, it, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible accident. And he was on the train. He was not injured. But he walked out of his car and he saw this scene. And he talks about it in, the, in his speeches and in his letters and in his diaries. Uh, he was deserted by his wife. These were real people. They had real problems. His wife deserted him and his two teenage sons and joined a commune and ended up uh, in the South Pacific Island eating coconuts. Uh, this was a very dignified uh, religious man. This was a horrible embarrassment to him. Uh, and one day I was reading in his diary and he said, I went, to, this is five years after she left, I went to the courthouse today and got a quiet divorce. And he said, I hope the press doesn't find out. And I thought, fat chance. Uh, it ended up to be quite a large story. Not only the press, the New York Times ran the story. Wow. Uh, so anyway, it, it was wonderful to find out about these people and to read about them, and then to be able to tell their stories. So I've tried to tell the, the history of our university through the stories of those people. Uh, surprises, I was surprised you know, when I first got into it, although it's, it's common knowledge, one of the first schools we had was pharmacy. 1893, uh, we had a new president, James Smart, and he was smart and he was full of ideas and excitement and energy. And he, the people in Indianapolis uh, in the pharmacy uh, kind of convinced him that he should start a school. And we did in 1884. Now that's very early. We were the third public pharmacy school in the nation. And uh, for a while, the, the pharmacy students were considered separate from the regular student body. At first, it only went 20 weeks. Then they raised it to 26. Then they kept raising it up. In a very short time, they were doing four years. Uh, but in the, in the, you look in the yearbook, they put the pharmacy students separate from the, the other students at the really, university for that. many years. Uh, but if, you know, pharmacy, we, we were a leader in, in getting that going. We had great help. Th at that time, pharmacy was undergoing great changes because the, 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 the drugs that were not good, they were just alcohol, were being sold. Uh, drugs had cocaine in them, uh, morphine, all kinds of things that were unlabeled. And uh, the pharmacy at that time was emerging to give people the drugs they needed the proper drugs they needed, properly labeled, and you know properly identified. So we, we were a leader in getting a lot going, and uh, early early partner with Eli Lilly, which which continues today. But big right. important Indiana company. I was surprised Purdue had the first m public medical college in the state of Indiana. They located it in Indianapolis, and uh, IU was not happy. IU wanted to have the medical school. Uh, there was some debate whether. For in, within them whether they wanted to have it partly in Bloomington and partly in Indianapolis. But when Purdue opened one in Indianapolis, IU opened one in Indianapolis, and a war broke out between Purdue and IU that made a, a, a Purdue-IU basketball game look like a Sunday school picnic. Wow. It was vicious. <laughs> the Indianapolis Star had headlines like, the, the scaffolds are out. Uh, it went to the state legislature. They decided they didn't want to deal with it. But the, some, something had to be done. Something had to be done. IU was on the verge, if Purdue had continued the medical school, of starting their own medical school and starting agriculture and starting engineering, and we would have two universities not too far apart doing exactly the same thing. And the legislature was not going to stand for that very long, so there would have been some major changes. Our President Stone stepped in and made the decision to, to give the medical school to Indianapolis, and uh, some people would criticize him for that today. I think it was the right decision. It led to a whole uh, uh, policy between Purdue and IU that they would, for the most part, cooperate in the programs they offer and, and what they're doing. We compete a lot in athletics, right. but everybody who works at Purdue knows counterparts at IU, and, and we work together. Well, usually in our dialogue here, uh, I give the guests a chance to ask me a few questions, and so maybe you've got a question or two. Well, sure. We're celebrating our 150th anniversary this year and going at giant leaps. And we know that uh, Neil Armstrong's 50th anniversary of the moon landing is coming up, and that's pretty exciting, too. Uh, what kind of things is pharmacy going to be doing this fall to, to join in the celebration? That's a great question, it, and um, it is uh, the 135th, as you indicate, the 135th anniversary of the College of Pharmacy this year. Uh, we are, uh, as you stated, one of the oldest colleges on our campus, the third oldest, actually third oldest college on, on this campus. Uh, we've been doing the pharmacy thing for a long time, and so we'll celebrate our 135th class. We'll celebrate with them with the white coat uh, ceremony that we normally have in the fall, and we'll have a very special guest back, uh, Dr. Vicki Anchek, who is the 
former dean at University of Oklahoma and a former dean at Virginia Commonwealth University uh, School of Pharmacy. Vic is one of our distinguished alums. He'll be here as our, our keynote speaker for our white coat ceremony, ceremony. And so it'll be an exciting time with the 135th class of Purdue University College of Pharmacy. And then October is the dedicated month for pharmacy to be highlighted in the Giant Leap Celebration. And so we have got a lecture series scheduled it's part of the Ideas Festival that has been ongoing here on campus uh, under the theme of Live Long and Prosper, uh, <laughs> under the health and longevity theme of the impact of science and science fiction, as it may be, and, and, uh, and medicine. So we'll have a, a speaker, uh, Guoping Feng, who is a, a distinguished professor at MIT, who will be speaking on autism. We'll have Dr. Walter Korschitz, who is the current director of the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, so it's going to be great to have one of the directors of the NIH Institutes here on campus speaking. Uh, and then Dr. Sally Sattel, who is a noted psychiatrist and author, lecturer at Yale University. She'll be speaking on the opioid crisis. Uh, and so those three are confirmed. We've got a couple other things that are in the works that we think will be real high impact and highly visible. Uh, and so we hope to get those in in September or October. So keep, keep an eye out for some of the things we'll be doing along uh, uh, in the fall. Not so much, it's not so much as we say uh, about bringing attention to the College of Pharmacy, but to highlight the impact, again, that our people have had uh, and that will have on, we believe, on society and our culture. Uh, it's completely aligned with our land-grant mission as a university, both in terms of teaching and research. Uh, and so it's exciting to be able to share the stories of the College of Pharmacy in, in October. We'll be the featured college at the homecoming game, uh, and so that'll be something also to watch out for. So there'll be a lot of highlights for the College of Pharmacy, our 135th anniversary, as we link that up with the 150th anniversary, as we, anniversary of Purdue, and think about not only the giant leaps that we've taken in the past, as you just alluded to, to impact pharmacy as a profession and healthcare, but what we will be doing in the future uh, to, to guide our profession and, and, and improve the, the health of both Hoosiers and folks around the world. And so it's going to be an exciting time for us uh, in the fall. Yeah. Well, John, thank you for spending some time thank with you. us thank today. You Your book is available on Amazon, correct? Yep, Amazon or through Purdue Press. Okay, online. and so they can find it ever true, mm -hmm. uh, 150 years uh, of Purdue history right there. Uh, it is a, it, it is, I think it is an authoritative, uh, comprehensive look at, at Purdue's history. So I encourage folks to go out and, and, and maybe buy the book uh, and read about it and, and learn something new about Purdue as you discovered all this, this new stuff. It was a lot of fun learning, yeah, learning new things. Great. Any questions, Maria? Uh, no, no questions uh, for, from our viewing audience, but as you watch the video, in the coming days, if there's something that piques your interest, be sure to post a comment or question. We'll try to get back to you there on the Facebook Live site uh, and uh, address any questions that you may have. So thank you again for watching. Thank you, John Norberg, John Purdue, for spending some time with us today. Uh, and as we say every time, as always, all hail Purdue and boiler up. Live long and prosper. Okay. <laughs>